and welcome to Old Timey Crimey Presents The Murders on Lover's Lane, Episode 3. I am Christy. And I am Amber. And this week, we are going to be in Illinois, actually, uh, after spending uh, two episodes in Fort Wayne with the Bicycle Bandit. Love it. Who, uh has not left our hearts nor our lives, as he will make a a couple of appearances this week. But we are going to be talking about uh, a little place called Bloomingdale Township and uh, a couple of areas around it. They kind of all seem to meld together and be constantly confused for each other. So essentially Bloomingdale, Glen Ellen, Cloverdale was once one of these places and now is just kind of like an unincorporated. So it's just a lot of... A lot of little townships. We know what that's like. We live that life. Yes, yes. We live we live that life where we have a town name that Christy and I both live in, but then we live in different townships. And depending on the paper, I could imagine they would use all the different little local names. Yeah, and if you're local, you know where that is. You know, sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes you have an experience like I did after living in this house for eight years while I was driving down my road. And like, I don't know. A quarter of a mile from my house, I saw a sign that said Village of Something. And I was like, has that always been here? What is that? I live there? I live there? So we are starting out on a warm summer night in 1925. A young couple is in an automobile on a lonely country road. They are Ivan Blake and Miss Frances Schuster. And right now, perhaps, there are no troubles worrying them, no concerns weighing them down, just, you know, the thrill of being alone together where no one else can see them. Brown chicken, brown cow. (laughs) Or so they think. So around 10 p.m., about a mile down the way, a farmer sees a guy walking down the road. He notices him like anybody who lives on a desolate road, notices someone walking down the road late at night with a little bit of a raised eyebrow and a hmm. Yeah, especially when it's not, like, common. Most of the roads I've lived in in my life have been roads where you don't expect to see someone walking down them late at night. So I, as soon as I read that, I my gut kind of clenches up a little bit and my shoulders kind of start to go up. <laughs> It just feels like, oh, what's he up to? What's he doing? Yeah, like, unless you're next to, like, a McDonald's or something, or, or like, some sort of 24-hour convenience kind of place, I wouldn't expect to see anyone walking at night. That's not a, a common time to be like, I'm just going to go for a stroll. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe, like, European cities where maybe you have bars that are open all night, which... Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like, some sort of establishment that people can walk to mm-hmm. makes sense. But it, a, a farm, a lonely road, that's not something you just go for a walk yeah. on. Yeah, what business do you have here? What are you doing? You know, so... Up to no good. Yeah. <laughs> You're up to some shenanigans. I just knew it. So, uh, you know, guy sees the guy. It's about 10 p.m., Around 10.30 p.m., Ivan, Blake, and Francis Schuster aren't alone anymore. So in this episode, in the Murders on Lovers Lane series, we have uh, a pretty big difference from the Fort Wayne case that was our first case. We have a survivor. Ba ba ba. And where you have a survivor, you frequently have a witness. Witnesses are questionable, but yeah, but better than nothing. Uh, yeah, we might get a better description than you know, uh, wearing overalls with a stripe and you know the stuff that we got for Dutch, aka the Bicycle Bandit, and so forth. So fair. It uh, look uh, like a man. <laughs> he like a the milk. <laughs> He's fond of the milk. Still the best description ever. It's he loves a, milk. He loves milk. If you have a cow, watch out. He loves milk and he buys things with chickens. Really, I don't know how nobody has tracked him down yet. 
<laughs> I still am in love with the idea of purchasing things with live animals. Really? I don't know how we're not doing this more. I would sell things. Like, I have a car that I am willing to sell if somebody wants to give me livestock. I'm serious. <laughs> it's not a nice car, but it drives. <laughs> Anybody with a goat. We got a car here for you, okay? Yeah, like mini goats would be great. Chickens. I was talking earlier about how I thought I could maybe smuggle chickens into the yard without anyone uh, raising eyebrows, even yeah. though it's not allowed. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, I want chickens. Fresh eggs. Fresh eggs are amazing. Love it. So Francis and Ivan, uh, let's talk about their ages first, because that is actually a huge question mark, at least as far as Francis is concerned. Newspaper reports have her age as either 19 or 25. We're going to drill down on that a little further. Uh, and they also list her as being variously from Glen Ellen, Hinsdale, and Bloomingdale. So these are all smallish towns and villages about 20 to 25 miles from Chicago, all in a westerly direction. Their populations could range anywhere from a couple of hundred to a few thousand in 1925. And then as far as Ivan, he also is said to be from pretty much all those same places. And his age is, is even more all over the place. We get 27, we get 30, we get 32. This actually is, I'm used to the newspapers being all, you know, like, sources very wildly. But I think this was probably one of the more egregious case, cases I've seen. Yeah. Egregious cases. Egregious <laughs> <laughs> words. Yeah. One of the most egregious cases I've ever seen. <laughs> That was the best unintentional Sean Connery. <laughs> I swear. So, yeah, the, the ages were absolutely absurd here. We really don't know how old anybody is just from reading the newspapers. And so, really, all we have when we first start learning about this case is questionable ages, questionable, you know, homes, locations where they come from, and then a little bit of information about relationships. Specifically, Ivan's. Yeah. He's got sort of an it's complicated situation going on. He's in the midst of a divorce, which was initiated by his wife of 10 years, Muriel, with whom he had three children, all under eight. Yeah. And not to make you sympathize with her even more but she'd had at least two, maybe three other children that hadn't made it over the course of their marriage. She probably spent quite a lot of time pregnant. Oh, yes, yes. And that's over 10 years? Yeah, so 10 years, we'll say six pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Plus back then, I don't even think it was formula a thing. She was probably nursing. Uh, yeah, that was either pregnant or nursing, like, constantly for mm -hmm. 10 years. Yeah. Now, the initial reports don't tell us much about Frances. We just get information about her as relates to Ivan. <laughs> so she's called his girl companion or his pretty young woman companion. We could relate that to sexism in the newspapers, and I'm sure that that probably pays a part. But she probably also has some reasons for not being very forthcoming about her life. M multiple reasons. There are some newspaper articles from further down the, the timeline, and we talked about this last episode, how things get really muddled when you get further on um, in the timeline. Although, surprisingly, not by much, just by a couple months, that say that these two are engaged and due to be married in a week. We have no proof of that. I have so many reasons to doubt it. It's never mentioned in the contemporaneous articles. And the fact that he's in the midst of a divorce, that this is kind of, like, obviously a secret thing. Um, his wife knows about it, but it still seems to be kind of... Uh, I don't think they're getting, getting married in a week. I just don't. Let's yeah, put it that way. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. There's also in that same article, I believe it was, a suppo supposed picture of the two of them which there was never a picture of them in any of the articles that were published in the actual. Amber, stop doing research right now. <laughs> no, you, you lit a, a light bulb in my head, and I, I'm just trying to find something. Okay, all right. There are a lot of infant Blakes, by the by. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We have no idea 
how long they've been hanging out. It's really interesting, actually, if you compare the information we get about their relationship with the information that we get about Howard Fisher and Catherine Herbers back in Indiana, because there's this sweet dating thing going on with Howard and Catherine. And, and they were going to get married. And, and they, Catherine's they, journal. Yeah. And then this is like a secret affair. This is illicit. Yeah. Well, I mean, technically, he's still married, and yes. she is dating a married man. Yes. That's not okay. You don't want to broadcast that. And from the outset, it's definitely, it's not like the newspapers are, go are going all tabloid about it, but they're not necessarily hiding that aspect of it either, which is certainly interesting. So, to sum up, we have uncertain ages and towns of origin for the couple, Ivan's got a divorce brewing, three kids at home, a pretty girl who's very much not his wife to whirl about in his automobile, and they're about to go for what they don't know is their very last tryst. So it is Sunday, June 15th, 1925. Comfortably warm evening. Temperatures had been uh, around 80 that day, so, you know, the evening's starting to cool off a little bit. Francis and Ivan go out automobile riding, which is starting to sound too familiar mm -hmm. already. And so they go out on lonely roads around the Illinois countryside. They're looking for a good place to pull over and um, uh, chat. And uh, they finally find one of their favorite spots. They've been there before. And uh, the next part of the story, it's around 10.30 p.m., gets told a few ways in different newspapers, and I thought it would be interesting because they're so brief to give you examples and compare them. Now, the newspapers set up the scene fairly similarly, placing the couple on the road, quote, sitting in the parked automobile, which could technically be true, depending mm -hmm. on what stage of whatever activity they were doing. So, uh, this from the Chicago Tribune. They were sitting in the car when she noticed a man walk idly by. She told Blake they had better move on, but just as he attempted to start the car, the stranger appeared and shot him in the left cheek. He then turned the revolver on her, she said, shot her in the mouth, dragged her out of the car, and attacked her. The second one from the Naperville Clarion. The murderer appeared as from nowhere, Miss Schuster said. He said hello, then shot her escort and shot her when she grabbed for the gun. He threw a blanket over the girl's head and dragged her from the car. After he had attacked her, he left her in the bush at the roadside. And then finally, in the Effingham Daily Records, we have one in her own words. I was going to say, I actually have a different version of events, but not in her words. But mine's completely different than the two you just read. I want to hear yours before we get to her own words. So, uh, neither Blake nor Miss Schuster knew that anyone was near the car until a shot rang out immediately beside them. Blake slumped off the seat into the floor, shot through the head. He died instantly. Miss Schuster leapt from the car to the road, but the stranger, who she had not yet seen, seized her and tried to draw her to the side of the road. She fought back at him, and he fired his revolver again. The bullet pierced her jaw and rendered her speechless. Uh, she told later that while she was lying in a semi-conscious and helpless condition, she was mistreated by the murderer. You're not actually going to believe this, but one of the newspapers that I found actually said the word rape. Oh, they said it? It was the Naperville Clarion. Yeah. Wow. I know. I was shocked because... Uh, every other one, it was attack, criminally assault, criminally attack, etc. Yeah, mistreat. That's one of the more euphemistic terms as far as that's concerned. And to actually see the word, it, it's almost like my sensibilities have gone all old timey because I was actually shocked I needed to clutch my pearls. <gasps> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, they said the word. <gasps> but in this one, she actually gave a, a pretty detailed description, if this is correct at all. That is that is very detailed. That's much more detailed. I think they really compressed it in a lot of the uh, the ones that I have. Yeah, she. Uh, I think a lot of what you have is similar to um, 
the summary of, of how the attack went, but she actually, in her own words, sums up the end. Then he rushed at me with a blanket and threw it over my head, she said. I hardly know what happened after that, but I do remember him dragging me from the automobile and attempting to attack me. I was nearly smothered by the blanket. That's all I remember until they found me and brought me to the hospital. Um, so she's left in, you know, in the bushes by the side of the road. And she doesn't remember what happened next. But I'm sure that the, the gentleman who ended up sort of rescuing her, but she also sort of rescued herself, I'm sure he couldn't forget it for the rest of his damn life. Because this is really the way it's described. Quite a scene. She is goddamn good and well going to do whatever it takes to get back to civilization and safety. Uh, it's hard to find a bright spot in a story like this, but we've got one here. Okay. Oh, good. So... When she recovered consciousness, she staggered into the highway, and eventually a motorist came along. He hesitated about stopping, but slowed down, and she leaped upon the running board of his car to tell her story. He took her to the village of Bloomingdale, and from there Sheriff John Hesterman was summoned from Wheaton, and an alarm sounded. She jumped onto the running board of his moving car. He slowed down. He didn't stop. Wait, so, wait, in this story, though, was she shot in the jaw? Yeah. Oh, my God, how terrifying would that be? Yeah. <laughs> So she's, and she's trying to tell her story. I'm sure she's not very good at it, but he's probably getting the picture. <laughs> like, she, yeah, pretty much. And she's like, oh, <laughs> you're going to listen. Or, you know, she's at like least. like gurgling and spitting blood as she's trying to make words. Yeah, this is a very unfortunate case of a picture uh, is worth a thousand words. <laughs> this is a very, very unfortunate case of it here. Uh, but fortunate for her because he w got her to safety. So, but yeah, like she's going to hang on to life by ragged nails and literally broken teeth if she has to. And I really admire that. Boy, I hope I don't find anything problematic in her story. Oh, no. Anyhow, so they get to the hospital. She tells her story. I'm going to assume through pen and paper um, they say that she won't be able to speak for a while, but she is re expected to recover. So that's good to hear. And not only has word of the bicycle bandit of Fort Wayne made it back to Illinois, so has the ironclad belief among law enforcement officials that no crime has ever occurred or can ever possibly occur unless a bicycle is involved. Must have been that damn bicycle kid. It had to be the bicycle kid. So, State's Attorney Chauncey Reed of DuPage County took charge of the case immediately after he was apprised of the crime. He was at first inclined to believe the story Ms. Schuster told was incoherent, but when he learned that a bicycle found at the crime scene had been stolen from a nearby farm and an hour before the murder, he was satisfied. He said that the girl's narrative was largely correct. Oh, my. It's, it's, so she's only correct because he found a bicycle. Bicycle, bicycle. As soon as he hears the magic code word bicycle, I he immediately believes her. My bicycle. So they're they're talking to the Fort Wayne police. News is going back and forth. Telegraphs, telephones, television. No, um, and televangelist. Televangelist. Yes. Yes. And the news hits Fort Wayne with a pretty big shockwave because this is, you know, we thought we were the only ones, you yeah. know. But uh, within a few days, this editorial appears in the eternally witty Fort Wayne News Sentinel. Oh, no. Oh, Amber. Oh, Amber. All right. All right. Give it to me. You do not know the delight awaiting you. Dutch, the hero of our Sherlocko saga and otherwise known as the milk-fed bicycle bandit of Pontiac Street, is believed by our local authorities to be the same fellow who murdered a Wheaton, Illinois man and seriously wounded his sweetheart early Monday morning, leaving a wheel there along the roadside. It does not yet appear that it was the same bicycle which is alleged to have been purchased by the murderer here, nor does it appear that the f poor fellow got the gun with which he committed the Wheaton crime. But it must be Dutch. The authorities are convinced that it must be Dutch. They won't have it any other way. No siree. 
where did the peddler of the highways and byways get a new gun? And how? He paid his rent here, we are solemnly assured, with chickens. Probably he paid for this second murder gun with a chicken, which, we no doubt, he had led away from the Pontiac Street hut, hitched to his bicycle. As the immortal Swinburne might have been pleased to remark, fiddle we know is diddle, and diddle we take it is D. Wow. <laughs> um, there's so much in there. And if anyone could make me a comic with somebody on a bicycle with a chicken strapped to it running alongside so that he can use said stolen running chicken to buy a new gun. <laughs> I would really like to see that. Please, please make sure that said man on bicycle has a glass of milk. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. First of all, they wrote in their own goddamn paper about guns that he'd stolen during robberies that were not found in the shack or in the... Buried. Buried holes, yeah. So that's probably, maybe, you know, like he does all kinds of burglaries and stuff. We can probably just assume that he stole a gun. Yeah, and he <laughs> got the bike by stealing it an hour before. So, I mean, we know he steals things. It's... They're, they're taking liberties because they want to have fun with this and they want to poke. They're, they're really poking at the local police. They're, yeah. they're really poking at the bear here, actually. <laughs> and uh, they do tell us that Dutch, the local police back in Fort Wayne, had traced Dutch as far as Hammond, Indiana. I think that's it. I'm pretty sure it's Indiana, which is just under 50 miles from where the murder here took place. So... Not too far, actually. You could get there on a bicycle. You could get there on a bicycle, yeah. And uh, so now, of course, Detective Kavanaugh of the Fort Wayne Police Squad is taking his longest road trip yet. So I hope the snack budget has a little bit of padding for him. Because he's coming to Illinois to help with the investigation. Oh, of course. Of course. So the sheriff of DuPage County gathers up a posse and they beat through the countryside while they're waiting for, you know, the cavalry to come from Fort Wayne. They didn't find any clue as to where the murderer went. They talked to Mrs. Blake, Muriel. She says she knew her husband was, quote, a frequent companion of Miss Schuster, but she doesn't know anyone who would want to murder her husband. Those two statements, I have to say... Don't go together. They're definitely really intriguing when placed in such close proximity. <laughs> I think uh, I think you shouldn't say them so close to one another. I think you shouldn't. And uh, so we do get a description, like we said, from Francis Schuster. So she gives them a description, then she even elaborates on it a little bit more. And it's a pretty detailed description compared to some of what we've gotten before. So he's a young and sturdily built man of a blonde complexion. He wore a brown cap and blue coat and trousers, which she thought were brown. He escaped on foot. And then she added some details uh, the next day. He was about five feet, nine inches tall sturdily built, smooth shaven with thin face and pointed nose. She said she thought she would recognize him if seen again and he weighed 150 pounds. Now, I also have a detail that he spoke in a thin, high-pitched voice. Interesting. Which is hilarious. Could you imagine being attacked by somebody who talked like, uh, I don't know, Ralphie from The Simpsons. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what to do with that thought. You're in danger. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Because that's immediately where my mind went. Like, that's hilarious. Even, even with the gun in my head, I would probably laugh. Be like, oh, you unfortunate bastard. <laughs> That is hilarious. 
that's definitely something I would keep in mind for when we get later down the road. With oh, especially is down the, the road a pun? It feels no, like no, no, a no, pun. no. Sorry, it's not intentional. No, it no. feels like it's, a pun. It, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. It's <laughs> not. It's an unintentional pun. I will admit it's a pun. I did not mean it at all. I was just thinking of our cases uh, that are going to be further down the timeline in like 1930. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do think from the glancing over them that there's some voice stuff in there too. So just something to consider. So regarding the description though, I don't want to doubt her. I do have questions about how she saw him so well on a country road in the night when there was a waning crescent moon. Well, she said that apparently she was able to get a a decent look at him in the dim reflected light from the car. Okay. All right. So um, that was in in the article I have where she was describing him. She said that it was, and I think because in that story too, she had jumped from the vehicle and ran. And so that car door is open. So there's going to be a little bit of, of light coming out of the vehicle. Depending on how they have that set up in the in like the old timey cars, I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> I have never been in a nineteen twenty something. Oh, I can't think of a funny name. Rentaru. I have no idea. Rentaru T. Uh, so naturally, in this kind of a case, you know, we we've talked about it before. One of the big motives that they like to go straight to is jealous lover. And so the detectives, are, of course, are going to start asking her more personal questions. And I think it's important to hear how the newspapers presented this exchange of information to their readers, just flat out. So uh, Ms. Schuster today was questioned by state's attorney, Chauncey Reed, as to whether she had ever gone to the trysting place with any other man than Blake. She said she had not. She also denied that she had ever been married or knew the man who attacked her and her married companion. She admitted that she had been to the scene of the murder on former occasions with Blake, and this led the prosecutor to believe that a jealous suitor or husband might have stalked Blake and Miss Schuster. So she's like, I've never been married. And they're like, okay, so it's got to be a husband. (laughs) They go straight to it. And sure you haven't, sweetheart. (laughs) This is where kind of... Everything gets, it crashes to a halt in Francis's story. It literally stops because almost nothing shows up of her in the newspapers after this. Francis Schuster almost entirely disappears from the historical record. It's a really strange damn thing. Um, So started to see what else I could find aside from in the newspapers. Um, Okay. 1910 census record. Let's look in her past. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, In Hinsdale Village, which is in this proper region, you know, where she's from, there's a little girl named Frances Schuster. Uh, It's spelled similarly to how the newspapers of 1925 spelled it, but not the same. It's missing the E. Um, Just the E. The age would have been about right. Uh, She was seven years old at the time of the census. And the family in the house was her father, Martin, a plumber, mother, Amelia, elder brothers, Martin Jr. and William, and little sister, Lydia. So that seemed to line up a Francis Schuster in one of the towns cited as her hometown. Name a little off, nothing surprising there, you know. Um, Oh, no, not spelling your name wrong. Yeah, age a little off. Okay, we're starting to pile up the inconsistencies a little bit. Well, the age a little off, though. I'm not going to write that one off because the newspaper has called her all sorts of different ages. Yeah, it seems like nobody knows exactly what her age is. I'm starting to wonder if she knows what her age is, you know? Maybe she lies a lot. So, but there was nothing in it. You're not allowed to do research right now. (laughs) I'm not. (laughs) I'm not. I'm just making sure (laughs) because this is my moment. This is what I worked for. (laughs) Give it to me. Okay, it to all me. right. <laughs> she put the phone away, ladies and gentlemen. This is my time to shine. So there was nothing for her in 1920 or even beyond that 
lines up. I was able to find Francis Schuster's, but nothing that really fit. Uh, census, marriage, death, newspaper, nothing. So um, her father was in the house, and he's in the 1920 census with her brothers and her mother. So Martin Sr. gave the census taker their names, their vital details. Um, then he started to list his daughter, Frances, and he realized, oh, no, that's wrong. He had the census taker scratch it off. He says, okay, hey, no, replace that with my daughter, Lydia. Francis isn't in this household anymore. And then below Lydia's name, there's someone new, John Lachance. And underneath that is Francis Lachance. Oh, so she got married. She did get married. Yes, she did. That's a... Wait. Wait, you said the 1920. Uh-huh. So five years before this. Uh-huh. Oh, and they have a two-year-old son. No. Yeah. Yeah. So they're both adulterers. Yes. She's not Miss Schuster. She's Mrs. Lachance. No shit. Mm-hmm. Good find. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my God. You should have seen me. I think the neighbors heard me screaming. I was like, yes, I found her. I found her. <laughs> what a bitch. <laughs> I knew you would say that, too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How? How did she get away with this? All the papers are like, Schuster, Schuster, Schuster. And then all of a sudden, it's like, no, this broad's been married for five years. How did that not come out? They have no problem being like, yes, Ivan Blake, father of three children, who was being sued by his wife for divorce. They'll say that, and then, Miss Schuster. What? How? How? You can see, I suspect that they hinted at it. I suspect in some of those newspaper articles that I read to you, I suspect that they hinted at it, saying, you know, like, just back to back, uh, she denied she'd ever been married, and then they said they believed it was a husband. <laughs> like, <laughs> Wow. And it could have been, especially with her keeping him under. Uh, <laughs> are you looking her up? Or are you, I you am, spell it right? now that I have a different name. L-A-C-H-A-N-C-E. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just looking. I'm just looking. <laughs> I can't believe that, that she got away with that. Like, that's oh, yes. so impressive to me. I'm pretty sure she's gotten away with it up to this moment. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was her husband. Does he have an MO? Like an alibi? Um, He's got an MO. Does he have an alibi? I mean, it never comes up because the fact that she's married, I mean, it never comes out in the papers. So if the police questioned him, that's never made public. So we don't know. He must have been, like, a, a cop or a newspaper guy. He was a, uh, he worked for the railroad, actually. General Superintendent of the Signal Service of the CB and Q Railway. I can't believe. Which is, um, he made good money eventually. I don't know how much he made then, but in 20 years, he'd make some good money. Okay, so question for you, because yeah. I, I found this to be interesting. I actually have an article or two that says that Frances died a few days later. Yep. Oh, she did? <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'll tell you her fate eventually when we get to the end, but that also frustrated me because those articles are written um, in like December or something of the same year. And I was like, but there would be articles from the area. She was yeah. from. Yeah, like I was super were, confused because, yeah. like, there would be local articles about her dying in the same newspapers, not like syndicated articles about the, you know, the actual Lovers Lane murders. This is this is a very very frustrating case. <laughs> 
I was, I've never come upon something like this where, where somebody just disappears like that in the middle of a case. At the end of a case, okay. In the middle? <laughs> I was just like, Where, where'd she go? Yeah, she just <laughs> dropped off the face of the freaking earth. And that's why I was like, maybe she did die. <laughs> because there was nothing after that. And I'm like, is, did they just want to keep it hush-hush? I refused to believe that she died. I did believe about the hush-hush thing. And it was so weird how the picture in my head shifted so much. Because at first I had this whole thing about how her family probably like swooped in and took her home, hopefully out of like love and compassion and like hit her in the basement, you know, like, but, like to, let's, we'll bring her home because she's been through, she has been through something traumatic, you know, like yeah. that is, that's a horrible thing for anyone to go through. It doesn't matter what they've done. And, you know, to, to do, to have to live through that and then be hounded by police and reporters and everything. And hopefully her family was compassionate about it and didn't, like, you know, punish her for her, you know, sins or whatever. And then as soon as I learned she had a husband, I was like, wow, that whole movie in my head is a, is a really different genre now. Yeah? <laughs> it's different. Really different. Totally different director. Different actors. Dialogue just got dark. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it, it really changes everything, just having that one person in the picture. Um, so let's talk about that one person, I guess. Let's John with Chance. Yeah, and Francis. Now, they're li living in the same house, which is all the more proof. And how, hmm, how are you sneaking out at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday? And yeah. your husband's not like, where are you going? Like, even now, that would be like, what the heck? Not only her husband, but the rest of her family. Everyone's she like, lives oh, with her family. Sweetheart. Like, they had to know what was going on. Yeah. So, they have the son, David, when the, uh, he's two in 1920. And now, she puts her age down here as 25. Which, you'll note, considering in the last census, only 10 years ago, she was 18 years younger. I guess she lived a lot of years. <laughs> She lived a lot in those 10 years. She packed a lot yeah. into those 10 years. So I think just really, she just always lied about her age. Maybe maybe not when she was seven, you know, or, or maybe her parents just never really knew her age or something. But I, I honestly just think that she just follows that pattern. She just kind of like throws out whatever age she feels like. Now, John was 35. Breaking that down, of course, I think we need to think about what age she was when she had David. Unfortunately, she was anywhere from 15 to 23. Uh, and John was, no matter what, 33. So At least he told the truth. At least he told the truth, yeah. And we know that for sure, actually, because I found his draft card from 1918. Ooh, hoo, hoo. Yeah. look at you go. So I can give you a description of him if you would like to know what he looks like. I would love that. <laughs> oh, it's not nearly as... Uh... All right, so when he was 33, he was medium height, medium build, with gray eyes, dark hair, and had not lost any arms, legs, hands, eyes, or was otherwise physically disqualified. There you go. There you go. I can really picture his what he looks like in uh, in that description. Yeah, the face is very clear. Yeah, clear in that it's see through because it doesn't exist. Uh, David was not their only child, by the way. Oh. They had a daughter, uh, Virginia, also called Betty, in 1923. So uh, yeah, a two year old and a seven year old. So yeah, that's. That's the hat, and they're living with the whole family and everything. And um, as far as we know, they're definitely married. They could have been lying to the census taker for appearances' sake, but like I just don't know if her parents would go for that. You know, them living under their roof with two kids and unmarried. This this is like you just blew my mind. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm like so stuck on this. That this whole thing, like we said, probably goes a long way towards explaining why Francis Schuster disappears from the newspaper articles about Ivan Blake's murder pretty quickly. I mean, within days of, of when this whole shit show started. 
And then the articles themselves dry up probably because the central witness here is not talking. Just to give an example, if you search for Ivan Blake on newspapers.com, June 1925, you get 26 results on Monday, June 15th, 22 the next day, 6 the next day, and then the rest of the month they just peter out. And that's for a murder. Yeah. You know? And it's just, it's just quiet. It's amazing how something like somebody dying can just poof, disappear. Well, and so that was one of the things that I found really kind of suspect to me. And I I honestly thought, I'm like, if she was married to a cop, I understand now why this was so quiet. Mm -hmm. Because it feels too quiet, especially for a small town. We live in a small town. Anything happens, it's big news. Somebody just drove through the Arby's the other day. All over the place. That's all I saw for days. And so for, for a murder in a small town on a lover's lane... To just be like, mm, we don't need to talk about that anymore. Yeah. I'm like, bullshit. Somebody knows somebody, and they're keeping this out of the news. Yeah. Now, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a cop. It could be, you know, maybe John Lachance is buddy-buddy with the, you know, so an editor yeah. at a paper. And, you know, they're the local papers will be like a sort of a a source for the wire services. Okay. Like the wire services. If you keep it out of the local papers, it doesn't go to the bigger paper. Exactly. It does. It, it, I, ever, I w- was an intern at my local newspaper in college and I had an article or two that hit the AP. You fancy bitch. I know, right? <laughs> they would watch for breaking news from local papers and that's where they pulled them from. So, like, that's where they find their news. So if you keep it out of the local news, you have a good shot of keeping it out of the national news and keeping it away from the the, the wires and keeping it away from everybody else. And then eventually it'll just die down. And that's a, a lot of what this did, but some stuff does pop up again later. So we still have more to it. We get the usual hints that there's an investigation going and that they're bringing men in to interrogate we get a Paul DePardo of West Chicago, which was so confusing to me. I saw West Chicago so many times. I'm sure there's people from Illinois who are, like, nodding their heads at this or I don't know. But apparently there's a West Chicago that is not actually in Chicago, technically. I guess kind of like how we have an Indiana in our yeah. state and a California. And a Washington. And a Washington. We have a town that's called Northeast. We have a town that's called Blue Balls. Yes, that's true. Yes. And intercourse. So yeah, it's West Chicago, but it's not actually in Chicago. And it's just within a couple miles of of these towns. Close enough. Um, So Paul DePardo, West Chicago, uh, was arrested after attacking a 13-year-old girl the same evening as the Lover's Lane murder. So they were like, oh, maybe it's this guy. And then it wasn't. And about six weeks after the murder, there's a coroner's jury, jury... returns an open verdict because Miss Schuster is still recovering and she's not ready to testify yet. We continue to call her Miss Schuster because that's what the newspapers are calling her. And I never really did get into calling her. I mean, I call her Frances most of the time anyhow, but they issue a warrant for John Doe because that's all they have. So once again, that's our second John Doe warrant. Go get him. Go get him. All these John Doe warrants and nobody can find him. And uh, the Naperville Clarion tells us no evidence was submitted to the coroner's jury which would fix the name of the slayer. But in the same article, and this is weird and frustrating, we learn about John Peterson. Now, he's the latest man brought in as a suspect after, quote, a serious charge made by two Batavia boys. And it's confusingly written, but it seems like I couldn't decide whether that charge was made by those two Batavia boys that he had done something to them or that they had witnessed him and thought that he had done the murder. The way it was written was it could have gone either way. But it says that Miss Schuster could not identify him as the murderer and then there was nothing more in the newspaper that I could find, which is really goddamn weird Because that very same article ties Peterson to Dutch. 
the nickname of the otherwise nameless bicycle bandit suspected in the murders of Catherine Herbers and Howard Fisher back in Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. So it's like all this fascination and obsession with Dutch back in Fort Wayne. And then somebody in Illinois thinks they have him and nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Uh, and this is also, I think, the only instance where I can find any mention of Francis trying to identify a suspect. Then there's really just nothing or next to nothing for months. And this is really why local journalism is important. Because for some reason, nobody was paying attention to this case or was really trying very hard. And so nothing really came of it. You know, for all of my insults against the Fort Wayne News Sentinel, and I have plenty more left in me, I'm sure, they followed the damn case. You know, they had all their editorials ready and they they wanted to poke the bear all the time and that's fine but they followed the case headlong into a grave like hole sometimes but when you follow the case you keep it alive yeah and it makes it stays in the national news it stays in people's minds and it has more of a chance of actually getting solved and when you have these big conglomerates like buying up all the local newsrooms and shutting them up and then having nobody on the ground actually covering stories, that's when we're going to have all of these missing and murdered people falling by the wayside because nobody can get attention for them. Yeah. So that's my little preaching for the day. Well, so you remember the tiny I told you last week about uh, the newspaper guy who it was a cold case. And every single day, he printed their names on the front page of the paper so they would not be forgotten. Exactly, yes. You can make such a big impact by doing just little things to make sure that it doesn't fade into obscurity. Mm -hmm. And that's, we, we always kind of just talk about our bonus episodes, like, without even thinking about, like... <laughs> Patreon.com. <laughs> like, we're like, you remember that tiny, like... Like, everybody knows what we're they referring to. They should know. Those are our old-timey crummies at patreon.com slash old-timey crummy. Or is it old-timey crummy.patreon.com? I can't remember. Link's in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but the Fort Wayne News Sentinel is still covering the case a little bit, mostly in jest. In late July, we have this wonderful little news blurb from them. Cycle Bandit, again, bops up near this city. Dutch, the bicycle bandit sought by police in connection with the double murder of Miss Catherine Herbers and Howard Fisher the night of May 7th. Uh, details, details. Police had a telephone call. <laughs> details, <laughs> details. <laughs> details, details. Police had a telephone call that a suspicious character answering description of the cycle bandit was approaching the city on the Leo Road. Motorcycle officers Vashon and Burton, those guys again, made the run. The cyclist proved to be Frank Davis, 610 and a half Lafayette Street, a resident of the city for 20 years. So you can see that, you know, once again, I'm immediately proven wrong. Um, I'm like, local journalism is so important. And then the Fort Wayne News Sentinel is showing how local journalism is just getting people freaked out. <laughs> but I've lived here for 20 years. There's two sides to every goddamn coin. Never seen you before in my life. And I tend to be on the wrong one. So, and um, the thing is, is that there are at least two more sets of murders in the 1925 Lover's Lane series. And then we still have the, the 1930 and then some others scattered about that we're going to look at. And as far as I can tell, this case isn't really brought up much, if at all, in connection with them, even though when it happened, it was frequently mentioned in connection with the Fort Wayne case. So it's kind of weird that it sort of gets dropped out of contention. Not contention, it's not a contest, but it sort of gets dropped out of the list of the Lover's Lane murders. Mm -hmm. It's it's a strange thing. So... Um, I don't really know what to do with it, but the uh, the aftermath, I guess we can talk about what happened to uh, some of the people who survived all of this, the aftermath. I 
feel absolutely terrible for Muriel Blake. Her father, James, died age 61 on December 16th, 1925, of uh, poor health. He had had diabetes for much of his life. Almost five months to the day after Ivan died. Wow. She had a bad 1925. Uh, Muriel lived with her son, James, and his wives when he grew up. Um, He had a couple. He sort of uh, did the, you know, Matthew McConaughey style. Not not Matthew McConaughey real life, but Matthew McConaughey in um, the movie, you know. He's only done one, so. (laughs) He got older. They stayed the same age. All right, all, <laughs> right, right, all right. right, And Francis Schuster, Fran- I can say words, Francis Schuster lived. She did indeed, and changed her name quite a few times from what I'm seeing. Wait, well, are, are you sure? I only saw her the once. What do you have? Uh, I, I was just looking at this. So she did go with, with Francis uh, Lachance, but then they have other records... Of, um, like, switching it up. So, like, I, I need to look into them more to, to verify. But it looked like she maybe changed her middle name and then eventually switched to going by her middle name. But I want to look into that a little more. Okay. I'm curious. And the middle name is uh, Anne, I believe? Alice. Alice. That's, that's right. I knew it was an A name. Yeah. So, at one point, she was maybe Frances S., the chance. Well, Schuster. Yep. And then Francis A. And then Francis Alice. And then F. Alice. I think that just goes along with her shifting birth date. It very well I think well she's might. just, she's very loosey-goosey with those aspects of her identity. With with name, with birth date. I mean, I think. Ha ha! What? Is this real? Ho! Holy shit, I found her, her gravesite. Yeah. That's awesome. It has an actual date. I, I was just going to get into that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was really excited. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have not been able to find anything <laughs> on this woman. Because you didn't got... have her real name. <laughs> I don't, she doesn't have her real name. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Nobody had her real name. So the Lachance family defied fate. See what I didn't do there? And <laughs> stayed together. They moved to Creston, Iowa, nearly 400 miles from home. Uh, there they raised their two children. Uh, I believe John continued working for the railroad and was making pretty good money by the um, census data. Uh, some of them required you to put in your, your income. And at least the, the one I looked at, he was making the most money of everybody on that page. So... He was making like three thousand uh, a month. It was the most on that page. Yeah, he was, <laughs> but, he was doing all right by quite a good bit in most cases. So, and uh, so they raised their two children there. Francis died in nineteen seventy one. John died in nineteen seventy seven, and they're buried beside each other at Ottumwa Cemetery in Iowa. According to Find a Grave, she was born in eighteen ninety four. But her census data just varies with the wind, as usual. Family tree data varies. And I'm kind of uncertain, honestly, if her relationship with her family survived the decades, just from little hints. So her brother Martin's 1979 obituary in the Chicago Tribune read, Beloved brother of Lydia Lundberg and the late William. Now, that's all the siblings, except for Francis, who had passed at that point. William had passed in 1958. Lydia would have been the last of the family, their parents having passed already, too. It's just strange that she didn't include her sister at any, anywhere in there. She included all, the rest of the, included all the rest of the deceased family, except for her sister. But remember, during the census, it's like, oh, no, 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 scratch that off. So it also might have been to protect her. Like, they don't want anyone to associate this name with this attack. Well, no, but the census was in 1920. The attack was in 1925. Oh, I thought it was, the, I thought it was after that. that no, they it was in the 1920 the census. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's okay. No, it's, I understand. It's, it's all confusing because like, I'm all over the place in the records. 
Like, I feel like there was an attempt, though, regardless, to hide her identity. There was a weird attempt, I think. No, I can, I can definitely see it being not an attempt to hide her identity. I can definitely see it being a mistake just because, like, she lives in the house. Like, nothing really much has changed from the last time the census has taken. Yeah. Except that there's a husband and a kid there, too. So when the census taker is like, okay, your wife's name, uh, Amelia, your kids' names. Oh, we got, you know, William, we got uh, Martin, we got Francis. Oh, no, wait, sorry. No. Oh, that's right. Francis is, I married her off, but she's still living in the house. So we'll get to her. <laughs> Lydia. So scratch Francis off and put Lydia in. That's essentially what I see happening. We will never know because it's not like the census taker was like videotaping it. I'm just trying to figure this out. I'm trying to figure this out. So in the 1910 census, she was seven. Yes. And in the 1920 census, she was 25. I feel... No, that would still be wrong. I'm mathing in my head. I'm like, it would, it would be wrong either way. And so I'm trying to figure out what makes the most sense. Like, does... Uh, because when she was in the 1920 census, she had a two-year-old, right? Yeah. I mean, it is totally possible that they, like, married her off when she was 14. Yeah. And then they didn't want to admit that she was 14, so they had her lie. Yeah, she she might not have been, like, yeah, old enough to actually legally marry. I don't know what the laws were in Illinois at the time. And so then they just lied about the age so that it was fine, yeah, I'm, I, none of it makes sense. There was some shady shit going on here. Or there was some reason to lie about her age in 1910 to make her younger than she was, something that we're not thinking of. That's the only other option I can think of. I can't imagine what that might be. Um, to 10 and under eat free at Denny's? It might have something to do with some sort of government benefit. And I'm not saying that they were right, but maybe like they thought telling the census taker the truth would risk that government benefit. Could be. Or they could have kidnapped her. There you go. You gotta change your age all the time because uh, we don't want anyone to catch on. Yeah. Maybe she wasn't even their kid. And maybe that's why she was left out of the obit, because by then, all the whole house of cards came tumbling down. Yeah. Hey, we, we got a whole theory on this. Do we have any theories on the murder? <laughs> ah, her brother did it. Interesting idea. I just wish there's so many, so many black holes in this one where all the information just died, disappeared. So a, a lot of information died and disappeared, but maybe that's where we can, that, that's actually why I jumped to the brother. I'm not even going to lie. So the brother writes her out of the obit. They're probably not on speaking terms. No, it was the sister who wrote her out of the obit unless the brother wrote it in advance, which is a possibility Or the too. sister knew that he was not... Like, it was a no-contact kind of relationship. Possibly, yeah. And uh, immediately after the attack, after she heals up, her and her husband, she wouldn't have gone with the husband if she thought it was the husband. She wouldn't have gone with him. But instead, her and the husband take the kids and scram two states away. That's pretty telling. So they jump ship, get the hell away from the family, but they stay together and then maybe stop talking to the family completely. What about her dad? Could have been the dad. You're bringing disgrace to the family. What about Lydia? Hmm. Younger sister, though. Hmm. Very romantic soul who is has very rigid ideas about marriage and romantic love and Maybe. devotion and loyalty. Maybe, but... And then once they get, once it all has happened... The two sisters make a pact, but then, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just making things up in my dramatic brain. Well, the sister's the, the, not going to rape her. I don't, I don't when, know that the No, I didn't, her. I never said she did. Yeah. <laughs> I said, made, obviously they made up a story because the sister also does not fit the description. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's possible. I mean, it's not like rape kits existed, so maybe it was part of the story. Um... But also, there was an age difference. So maybe Francis was being coerced into something. We don't know if there was an age difference. Okay, fair. <laughs> fair. We, we don't know. We really don't. 
but it is possible that Francis was being coerced because uh, the Ivan Blake's wife left him for cruelty. I knew there was an article somewhere and I lost it. I knew there was one article that mentioned it and I could not find it. So yes. thank you. <laughs> yeah, 100% left him for cruelty. So this was not a nice person. So what if she was being coerced into it? What if it wasn't even a romantic relationship? Yeah. And she was shot through the cheeks. That's what it said in a few articles. Through the cheeks, not through the jaw. So totally possible that the family helped her off him and then shot her and put her clothes in disarray so that she could say that she was attacked, especially if they knew that this was already going on. So what if this was not, in fact, a mystery, Lover's Lane murder? What if Ivan Blake was just a son of a bitch that needed to go? Carrying a secret like this could really break a family apart. It could, couldn't it? Wow. <laughs> you know what? I think that in case we have some new listeners, we should really let them know that one thing we do like to engage in just for funsies is rampant yeah, speculation. <laughs> so that is all that is. It really is like, honestly, when you have these cases where there's just so much that you don't know, it, it honestly gets a little satisfying to try and patch some of those holes, even though you know that there's no way you're actually finding the exact truth. Because even in a situation where you don't even have all those holes to patch, you never know the exact truth. You gotta look. You gotta I look. have a look. Ivan Blank went after the sister. Francis stepped up <gasps> to get him alone. And then they attacked. Ooh, interesting, interesting. I like it. And whoever was the shooter... Missed him the first time and shot her accidentally. Hmm. Wow. But that would sure tear a family apart if you accidentally shot your sibling. And I can see that happening, yeah. Huh. Solved it. There you go. <laughs> we had some really fascinating scenarios. The writer in me is kind of getting itchy. <laughs> Fingers are all like... Nah. This was all to take out Ivan Blake. Uh, one random thing, and before I get to, um, well, I guess I have one random thing, and then I have one final note, but they do not mesh together in any way. In fact, they're very different from each other, and I um, apologize for the incredible shift in tone I'm about to engage in, but I don't know what else to do, because I have to say both of these things. Uh, first of all, I want to actually find some of these streets when there's a murder, but they don't actually give you the street name a lot of the time. And I was hoping that it would actually be called, like, a, as a last-ditch effort, I was like, maybe it's actually called Lover's Lane. So I tried looking that up. Uh, well, uh, turns out that there's actually a Lover's Lane chain of adult toy stores in Illinois. Oh, there you go. That really makes it difficult <laughs> to find any sort of street name, Lover's Lane in Illinois. And Amber's ADHD kicked in and all of a sudden there will be packages next week <laughs> right there's like 30 or 40 of their stores there or something and their motto is play together stay together I dig really, it really think we need a sponsor um and then like i said apologize for this shocking shift in tone but i do uh hope that if any of the schuster or lachance or blake descendants ever find this and hear it it, uh, not the, just the part about the adult toy stores, but the entire podcast <laughs> that it is enlightening and not upsetting. We, um, mostly try to be respectful, but it's hard to know where the line is a hundred years after the fact when you have, it's probably a family secret yeah, that you're kind of blowing up. Um, and it's impossible to truly know anyone, much less through a bunch of newspaper clippings. So I personally just hope that everyone who survived had happy, fulfilling lives. And if you happen to want to share some family dirt, we would be happy to hear it. And uh, if you do have any angry emails to send to us, that is, um, I was trying to remember like one of Chris's emails, but uh, fine. Old timey cry me at gmail.com. But just, you know, be. Polite. That's all I ask. I'm a person. 
You know? We try our best. We try our best. Yes. I just think it's funny that the, the ultimate mystery is how the hell old was Francis Schuster? That's what we walk away with. Right. <laughs> so I'm almost expecting to get an email from like a, a, a grandkid or a great grandkid being like, look, grandma always lied about her age. Every time I went to visit, it was a different age. Like, I expect that. Like, she'd be at church being like, oh, no, I'm only in my 70s. It's like, <laughs> grandma, you're 90. Like, stop it. I definitely had flashbacks to uh, the Golden Girls and like them getting uh, Blanche's birth certificate. Because they finally wanted to know her age. And it was uh, deleted on authority of the governor. <laughs> that definitely, I was like, yeah, that's, Francis would have done that for sure. Oh, yeah. I absolutely. mean, sometimes her age went up. Sometimes it went down. And even when, when she was older, sometimes it went up. It was never, it was, I don't think it was even a vanity thing. It wasn't like, oh, I can't get older than 40. No, it, it was just a, it just changed. She, I, don't, I don't think, I don't even know if she cared about age. Or she was running from the government, so she changed it all the time. I don't think there was a running from the government so much back then, unless you were Al Capone. And even that was more in the 30s. Maybe she was Alice Capone. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe that's one of her aliases. are pretty close to Chicago. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, Well, from us here at Old Timey Crimey presents the Murders on Lover's Lane. Are we doing do's and don'ts at the end? I forget. I can't remember. Do uh, confuse the hell out of everyone by constantly lying about your age. Don't laugh if somebody points a gun at you and says, you're in danger. <laughs> okay, I'm going to laugh anyhow. <laughs> and don't forget to set your parking brake. Bye. Bye. Sources. Sources. My sources are from newspapers.com. Thank you, Chris Garcia, The Dispatch, Journal Gazette, Rock Island Argus, Chicago Tribune, Nothingham Daily Record, The True Republican, and the Tri County Press, uh, MyHeritage.com, Find a Grave, and uh, the Illinois Digital Newspaper Collection. <laughs> I've been talking for an hour. Uh, my sources for this are solelynewspapers.com, thank you Chris Garcia, Rock Island Argus, Minneapolis Star, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Examiner, Pittsburgh Press, Logan's Port, Pharaoh's Tribune, The Commercial Appeal, Out and Evening Telegraph, Belvedere Daily Republican, Sioux City Journal. Woohoo! I have to pee. <laughs>